Um, so look, thank you, David. Uh, I wasn't really sure where I'm going to start, and to be honest, I'm still not entirely sure where I'll start. So we'll sort of start on about slide three or four is probably the best bit. So you'll notice that there's the, the number 20 is crossed out and the number 40 is written in. So several weeks ago, I, I got an email from the guys at Erlang Solutions, and they said, hey, Brett, would you mind giving a talk about RabbitMQ? And I said, well, yeah, look, that's fine, not a problem. Um, what do you want, some sort of sales pitch? You know, because the Erlang Solutions guys pro provide support and training and things like that for Rabbit. And I didn't get a reply. So I thought, OK, I'll just make it up. I'll just make it up anyway. So I put together some slides for a 20-minute talk, and everything was good. And then in the middle of last week, I get an email. Oh, by the way, that talk's now 40 minutes, Brett. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. I mean, basically what I want to do is uh, give a little bit of an overview of, of RabbitMQ. It's been around for some time now. I think the original version was around 2006, so it's, it's over a decade old. Um, so talk a little bit about Rabbit itself, talk about the AMQP protocol, advanced message queuing protocol, uh, and some history there as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, talk about the capabilities of RabbitMQ. Um, some of those extra slides I added in to make up the 40 minutes include some Erlang code because this is an Erlang conference, so I figured some code would be of interest to people rather than me just waffling on about features of the product and so forth. Um, the sort of sales pitch, as I say, I mean, I, I do some work occasionally for, for the Erlang Solutions guys around Rabbit consulting, training, things like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about if you use RabbitMQ or if you're thinking about using it and you have problems where you can go to get help but I'm not going to be biased and, and totally say that you should use Erlang Solutions, but you should. Um, there are other options, and we'll talk about those. And there could potentially be some digressions along the way, because I have to make up 40 minutes. If anyone who knows me probably is not that big of a deal. Once I start talking, I don't tend to stop. So how many people are familiar with the advanced message queuing protocol? Right, a good number, damn. Just what I didn't want. <laughs> So, I mean, the history of AMQP goes back to probably around about 2004 time frame and so forth. And, and I think on subsequent slides I go into a little bit more detail about that. But essentially, AMQP came out of uh, the financial services sector, and, specific, and more specifically, a guy by the name of John O'Hara, who worked for J.P. Morgan Chase in London at the time. And John had sort of suffered the nightmares of buying all these proprietary middleware integration products and so forth, and the darn things don't talk to one another, and you find yourself implementing gateways, and then you've got to support all these gateways, and you've got horrendous license fees for all those proprietary products and so forth. So John decided that there had to be a better way of doing this, and, and he came up with this vision for this sort of, I wouldn't necessarily call it all-encompassing, but mostly encompassing message queuing product that uh, did all the stuff that he needed done at, at J.P. Morgan Chase and maybe did a little bit more as well. And, and that was essentially how the protocol started its existence. <clears throat> and after a while, John set up a working group and he engaged a company called Imatix. I mean, how many people here know uh, or remember Peter Hinchins? Okay, so Peter, lovely chap, open source guy. Sadly, Peter died in October 2016. Um, but Peter and another gentleman, Martin Sustrick, uh, had, had the company Imatix, and they worked with John O'Hara to define the initial AMQP uh, standard, uh, the draft standard, and they also created a product, the first implementation, a thing called OpenAMQ, which was my introduction to the protocol. Uh, like David said at the start of the talk, I, I ported Erlang to OpenVMS. My background goes right back to Digital Equipment Corporation days, so the older people here probably know who I'm talking about. Digital was bought by Compaq, who were then bought by HP. Digital's flagship operating system was this thing called OpenVMS, which is, you know, the word open is something of a misnomer. It's, it's not a mainframe operating system, but it's certainly not a Unix operating system, although it does have some characteristics in common with both of those. But anyway, to cut a long story short, around about the 2006 timeframe, we were looking to try and implement some sort of AMQP implementation on OpenVMS. And our first option was to use OpenAMQ. It was all written in C, C++, well, actually C. So that wasn't too hard to port. But then, over time, strange things happened in the AMQP working committee, and Peter Hinchins and Imatix pulled out. So I was left with an unsupported product, essentially. So next up, I discovered RabbitMQ, which we'll talk about soon. And the issue there, of course, was that Rabbit was implemented in Erlang. So, you know, typical sort of barroom discussion, my, my colleague dared me to port Erlang to OpenVMS, which is basically how I got involved with this whole carry-on. Uh, got introduced to the Erlang Solutions people and kind of 
became some sort of odd member of the, uh, of the Erlang community. But anyway, I digress back to the main topic. So the original working group consisted of JP Morgan Chase, the iMatics guys, and then, and then other parties joined, like the RabbitMQ guys joined and so forth. Rabbit was started off, rabbitmq.com was started off by, uh, primarily by Alexis Richardson uh, and Matthias Radstock. Matthias was the, the CTO, the brains behind the operation. Um, Alexis is uh, an entrepreneur and he saw the potential for, for this protocol and, and figured that it would be good to actually have an implementation. Matthias came up with the idea of implementing RabbitMQ in Erlang, which is obviously a very visionary thing to do. So just on this slide, over time you'll notice you know, that the heritage of the advanced message queuing protocol, as I say, was in financial services. So you see a lot of financial services organisations. As time went on, you then started to get you know, software vendors and so forth involved in the, in the working group and so forth. Just wanted to talk a little bit about message queuing, and this was something actually that David and I were discussing last night that you know, some people kind of consider message queuing old hat, you know, is it still relevant and so forth. Well, yes it is. I mean, message queuing has had a, a fairly long and illustrious history and it, it's kind of never really been out of fashion. It's just kind of morphed and changed a little bit over time. I mean, products like MQ series, which is a very famous message queuing technology, has been around since the early 90s. But probably in the past decade, maybe decade and a half, there's been something of a resurgence in, in the need for message queuing, that kind of decoupling between the publisher and the consumer. Um, with the advent of cloud computing and these massively scalable, highly distributed application environments, you quite often need something like a, a message queuing system. So, you know, John O'Hara, his idea was really to, to, to do something to get him out of what he described as middleware hell with all these proprietary technologies, but what he possibly didn't appreciate he was doing at the time was also filling a gap for some of these, uh, some of today's um, applications that require this sort of technology. So as I say, John's motivation for AMQP was, as he described it, middleware hell. You know, sick of proprietary products that were very expensive, sick of these things not talking with one another without the need to develop gateways, sick of having to employ people with all these skills to maintain the gateways and understand the various products. Huge waste of effort, very costly to implement and so forth. The list goes on. So he wanted something that could be ubiquitous across the enterprise at J.P. Morgan Chase uh, and that would be useful to other organisations as well. Um, you know, I mean, John didn't think small. As I say, he wanted something that was fairly ubiquitous, all-encompassing, that could do, handle a lot of message queuing scenarios. <coughs> what they came up with with AMQP was um, I suppose is to some degree summarised on this slide, uh, has the concept of queues, of course, it's a message queuing technology, has the concept of exchanges. You publish messages to an exchange and exchanges work a little bit like network switches and are responsible for routing those messages into zero or more queues. I say zero because potentially you might not actually have a queue, in which case you're just publishing into space, but you can, you can actually do that if you feel so inclined. So you publish a message to an exchange, it gets routed to a queue, and there are bindings between queues and exchanges which determine how the routing topology occurs. And all of this stuff is essentially broker-based. So you, 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 have, you publish your messages to an exchange and a broker, the broker routes the message into one or zero or more queues within the broker, and those messages will be pushed out to any consumers. <coughs> The guys didn't want to create something that was only relevant to large organisations like um, JP Morgan. They wanted to create some piece of software here, some define some standard, create some piece of software that would be useful to anybody who needed message queuing, whether it's some sort of web-based pizza ordering system or whether it's the nervous system of, of, a, of a, an OpenStack cloud. They wanted this to handle you know, small numbers of transactions. They wanted it to scale to very high numbers of transactions, uh, potentially spanning the internet and so forth. Just talk a little bit here, I've talked about exchanges and queues and how you publish messages to exchanges and they get routed into queues and so forth. Um, one of the things within the protocol is support for different exchange types and indeed RabbitMQ allows you to extend this further by implementing your own exchange types. So if you have some kind of messaging topology which doesn't fit what Rabbit provides out of the box, you can write some Erlang code, write an extension uh, to implement alternative exchange types and so forth. 
But let's just look briefly at some of the more common or the more standard out of the box exchanges. So direct exchanges, this is kind of point to point messaging. Publisher publishes a message to exchange, uh, there's a binding to a queue and the messages end up in that queue. One point to note out the far side there on your right is that you can have multiple of those consumers, the things with the C in the middle, the black splotches with C in the middle. Uh, and the way in which RabbitMQ works is if you have multiple consumers listening on a queue, it will try and fairly balance the load. Uh, there are certain quality of service details which I won't bore you with, but it will try and balance the load as evenly as possible across all of those consumers. Next exchange type which you get out of the box with Rabbit is the thing called a fan-out exchange. In the case of a fan-out exchange, it largely doesn't care what the binding between the queue and the exchange is. Basically the message, the same message gets routed to all queues that are bound to the exchange. So we're going to publish to our exchange, there are three queues bound to it, each of those queues gets a copy of the message. Once again you could have multiple consumers hanging off those queues, not a problem. The other standard exchange type is what's referred to as the topic exchange. And this is the most versatile, probably the most versatile of the standard ones anyway where the binding between the queue and the exchange is essentially based on a regular expression. So that allows you uh, some additional flexibility when you're publishing messages. You know, you could have a scenario where one message might get routed to only one queue, another message because of uh, it, its, its um, routing information might get routed to multiple queues. So a lot of flexibility with that exchange type. Okay. So that's, that's a bit of background on the um, advanced message queuing protocol. What I should note is that what I'm talking about here is AMQP 0.9.1, um, as is used most commonly by RabbitMQ. Uh, AMQP 1.0 actually has some differences from this, but since we're talking about Rabbit, I'm not going to go into detail about AMQP 1.0. So, this is, um, actually, this picture, I'm, I'm trying to remember where that came from. I think that's, that's one of Alexis Richardson's, one of the, the founder of RabbitMQ. That was one of his favourite pictures for talks, and I stole it, so that's fine. He'll forgive me. Um, so what is RabbitMQ? Like I said before, the first implementation of AMQP was uh, the, the iMatics thing, open AMQ. Uh, Rabbit were pretty quick off the blocks, as you'd expect for a rabbit. Uh, and, and their first implementation came out around about the 2006 time frame. As I say, Matthias, the, the CTO of, of the company, decided that Erlang would be a great language in which to implement RabbitMQ. And I think this was a pretty astute decision. So what RabbitMQ is, it's an open source message broker. It's written in Erlang. Uh, you've got the broker. You've got the core AMQP protocol, uh, and you can also have adapters, which we'll talk about a little bit later, for, for different pro other protocols as well. So again, via plugins, you can extend uh, RabbitMQ to support other, other message queuing protocols, for lack of a better description. One of the really nice things about Rabbit, I mean, it really took off. Uh, you know, rabbits, rabbits breed prolifically, and what happened with RabbitMQ was that it seemed to breed prolifically. And I think at last count, well, I mean, it's, you know, these are kind of wave your hands in the air type numbers, but there's, there's at least 50,000 production deployments uh, of Rabbit around the globe today, and, and that number's showing no, no particular sign of decreasing. And these are fairly business critical applications in many cases. One of the nice things, though, that happened fairly o early on with Rabbit was that you ended up with a very large number of client implementations in just about every language you could think of. Um, you know, you pick a language within reason, don't go all silly on me and start talking about some of these esoteric things that, that Robert Verding gets into implementing and so forth. But all, all reasonably mainstream languages, you will find a client library uh, for RabbitMQ. So, you know, pick your favourite language and there'll be a library you can use to implement uh, clients. Clients being things that publish messages and or consume messages. So here's the history of the company. Like I say, the guys kicked off the first version around 2006, got involved with the, the working group. Um, since that time, as I say, very, very rapid adoption. I think in part it's got a catchy name, but from day one they produced a quality product. It worked well, it was easy to get going. You can install Rabbit and, and, and so forth in, in minutes and actually start using it. There's a lot of complexity under the hood uh, with RabbitMQ, but to actually just 
start using it in a simple context, it, it's a matter of minutes. It's a very simple model to understand in terms of how you work with it, publishing messages and consuming them. Um, so very easy for people to work with, plus all those different client language implementations. And also from day one, um, the guys did an incredibly good job on documentation. Very, very complete and concise documentation, uh, good blog posts, uh, also some good marketing and things like that. T-shirts, I should have worn my rabbit T-shirt. Um, you know, all of this stuff goes to making a good product. I remember in, back in 2010, I actually had a phone call scheduled with Alexis at, at RabbitMQ, and I called at the allotted hour, and there was a lot of noise in the background and much drunken hilarity. Um, the guys had just been acquired by VMware, um, which, you know, was kind of quite a good thing for them. Um, so VMware then subsequently, in 2013, um, spun out a lot of their software products, as some of you will know, into a company called Pivotal. Uh, and Rabbit ended up in, in Pivotal there. <clears throat> ah, there's, there's the T-shirt. I knew I had one somewhere. But, you know, in addition to supporting AMQP, the guys also realised that, you know, this thing's going to be used in some fairly intense environments. You know, high message rates, uh, you need to have high levels of availability and fault tolerance and things like that. I mean, a company like JP Morgan Chase, for example, they, they don't want their message queuing environment to go down spontaneously, otherwise bad things happen and, and money doesn't go where it needs to go, um, or possibly your pizza order doesn't get through or whatever. So this thing needs to be robust, it needs to be scalable, needs to be efficient, needs to be extensible, needs to be secure. These are all fairly standard criteria, but I think you'll agree, possibly with the exception of the T-shirt one, all of those points sit nicely with the Erlang model. <clears throat> so one of the things that was done, not in, the, not in the very first versions of Rabbit, but fairly early on, was the ability to take advantage of Erlang's distributed uh, and clustering capabilities. So you could basically create RabbitMQ clusters of as many nodes as you like. I think the largest one I've gone up to was something like 50 nodes. I mean, it starts to get a bit silly after that. I mean, that, that was more an academic exercise as opposed to something that was genuinely useful. But, um, but you can do that sort of thing. So I won't go into too many details about the clustering. Uh, you're all familiar with Erlang clustering and so forth. And, and as I say, Rabbit just leverages that. But one or two nice things, I mean, it doesn't matter if you publish which node you publish to and which node you consume from. The cluster, you know, every node in the cluster has a, a shared view of, of where those messages are and so forth, right, as you'd expect from a distributed Erlang application. High availability, I mean, obviously another criteria, again, leveraging features provided by Erlang. Um, the guys built in here the ability to mirror queues and so forth. I mean, one point that came up when I was talking to David last night was there's a common misconception that Rabbit stores messages that have persisted to disk. You can have volatile or, or persistent messaging. Um, there's a common misbelief that, that uh, persistent messages are stored in amnesia. They're, they're not. They're actually stored in a, a, a file format that the Rabbit guys came up with themselves, so I won't go into the details because it's long and complicated and I'm too tired to remember all the details anyway. Um, amnesia is really only used for storing configuration information, so details of exchanges, queues, bindings, security, things like that. Um, so anyway, around about, well, must have been about version 2.7, maybe a little bit later, 2.8, uh, the guys introduced, along with clustering, the ability to mirror queues and so forth. Um, this is now policy based, so you can effectively define a policy. If a queue name matches the, a regular expression, that queue will be replicated across one or more of the cluster nodes and things like that. Downside, obviously, to that replication is that you're chewing up some, some, some network bandwidth to replicate your data, but you, you're gaining in terms of the availability. <clears throat> um, really nice web based management UI. Uh, essentially, the way this works is there's a, there's a plugin that provides a, a RESTful API, and then the, the web UI is just one implementation of a client that uses that RESTful API. But you can, you can write your own clients to, to, to interact with the REST API. No big deal there. But the web interface is quite nice. I mean, these, these pictures are a little bit old, it's a slightly older version, 3.4.2. We're up to 3.7.2 something or other at the moment. Um, 
but I think you get the point. There's, there's quite a few screens in there if you click on all the links and so forth. Uh, what we've got here is just an overview screen and uh, the screen over there is, is looking at, at queues. Um, you can get nice graphs and stuff like that. So it's useful from the perspective of monitoring what's going on in Rabbit and making sure that, that, that your Rabbit is healthy um, and so forth. It's also an administrative tool, so you could use it to administer users. You can use it to create and delete queues uh, and, and all that sort of good stuff. So very nice little utility. Um, wasn't originally part of the plan. It was just one of the RabbitMQ team one night had this really inspired idea, whipped up a bit of JavaScript and, 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 and a bit of Erlang code and created the prototype of this. And I remember being at the office, I think this was in the VMware days, they were certainly in that building, so this would have been post-2010. Um, I remember being in the office the day that Simon had implemented this and he'd been up all night. I must admit, I've never seen anybody look so bad with bags under his eyes and things like this. It was absolutely dreadful, but very nice night's work. Um, from Simon's original implementation, it hasn't changed that much. Obviously, a bit of polish and things like that, but uh, yeah, nice piece of work. <clears throat> Security within Rabbit uh, comes at multiple levels. I mean, there's, there's basic authentication, username, password type stuff. I um, should also mention that Rabbit supports this notion of vhost, virtual hosts. So within one instance of RabbitMQ running, you can have multiple vhosts. And those are essentially little mini rabbits inside the big rabbit. Um, but in terms of, in terms of your, your, your security, as I say, basic to start with, you've got log on with username and password. But then you have permissions. Uh, and the basic ones there are read, write, and configure. So one of the things that AMQP allows you to do programmatically is to actually create and delete resources. So from within a program, you can create queues, create exchanges, define bindings between those entities, and so forth. Um, I mean, this is kind of different to most other message queuing products where all of that stuff has to be set up in advance. You can do that with Rabbit, but you do not have to. So the basic permissions, as I say, are configure, write, and read. Write being the abil ability to publish messages, read being the ability to consume messages. So they're your basic permissions. And how they are assigned, again, comes back to regular expressions and things, things like that. Okay. So you can define a, a particular user will have access to a particular resource based on a regular expression. If the regular expression and the resource match, then they have the permission in question, be it configure, read, or write. So a key point there, of course, is you know you kind of got to think a little bit about how you name your resources, how you name your queues, how you name your exchanges, because you don't want to come up with some stupid naming convention that then makes it really, really hard to use uh, regular expressions. <clears throat> Rabbit is very, very extensible. Again, this is one of the virtues, one of the things it gets by virtue of Erlang, I guess. Uh, you can write, I mentioned before, you could write your own new exchange types, you can write alternative authentication mechanisms, you can write plugins uh, to support different message queuing protocols, all of which leverage off the core RabbitMQ functionality. And this is where I thought we need to come up with some more slides and we'll look at some code. But I mean, the key point that I did actually want to make here is that, like I say, via plugins you can add support for additional protocols, message queuing protocols and so forth. Given a couple of examples there, MQTT, um, which is you know fairly common in the Internet of Things type space, uh, and Stomp, um, which is a fairly lightweight, very simple kind of textual based uh, messaging protocol. Key point to note is that, you know, there are a whole raft of these different protocols and people sort of start saying, oh, there's too many of these things, you know, why can't we just have one and things like that. Uh, I mean, they, they're all, you know, MQTT is good for some use cases, AMQP is good for some use cases. I mean, the, the notion of one message queuing protocol sort of being, being fit for purpose for all of the sorts of problems you're trying to solve is, is delusional thinking. So the ability for a product like this to actually be able to support different message queuing protocols within Reason is actually really very, very useful. You've got all that infrastructure around the clustering and availability and security and so forth, and you've got the ability to add in additional, additional support for other message queuing protocols. Okay, so like I say, the, the, the whole idea of one message queuing protocol fits all is, is possibly fundamentally flawed. AMQP is very, very flexible, but that flexibility comes at a price. To some degree, speed. Um, to some degree, 
weight. I mean, it's a, a relatively heavy duty protocol. Something like MQTT is far more lightweight and potentially more appropriate if you're you know, working with uh, sensor data on, on unreliable networks or whatever. Okay, so like I say here, some, some protocols are better optimized for low latency of small messages, other are better suited to large messages and so forth. In theory, you could use RabbitMQ to, to transmit messages that were several megabytes, conceivably even a gigabyte in size, but that would probably not be a good thing to use AMQP for. You might be better off actually using FTP or something for that, I don't know, SFTP. But, you know, so the notion of one protocol being able to do everything is flawed. The ability of the product to actually support multiple protocols, I think, is very useful. <clears throat> and we need some code. So this is just, just a fairly basic illustration. What are we doing? We're publishing via AMQP and consuming via Stomp. Um, so, you know, some fairly simple Erlang code. Uh, of course, we always use the default username and password because I'm too lazy to change these things. Um, very, very bad practice. We're going to publish a message, hello from Erlang client, and we're going to use this routing key called stomp, and our stomp consumer is going to successfully consume that stomp, that, that message. So the stomp protocol has basically been mapped onto um, the concepts within Stomp, there are essentially equivalent constructs within AMQP. So it's easy to map those protocols uh, in this way. Slightly more complex example where, you know, so you could publish via one protocol and say publish to a fan out exchange, which if you remember will, will, will uh, route the message to any queues that are bound to that exchange. So in this case, we're going to publish something to the default fanout exchange, amq.fanout, and we're going to have two queues bound to that in this example, although you don't see that, you just have to take my word for it. Uh, from one of those queues, we're going to have a message consumed via stomp. From the other queue, we're going to consume via amqp. So you can mix and match and do all of that sort of cool stuff that gets yourself totally confused. So, oops, sorry, Python, enough Erlang, but we're back to Erlang down here. You'll live. So, simple Python consumer, simple stomp consumer in Erlang. And another example, uh, in this case publishing via MQTT and consuming via stomp. Um, again, you know, there's so the MQTT plugin is standard, I mean that, that ships with Rabbit, all you've got to do is enable it. Um, there are actually quite a, a slew of plugins that ship with the product. Um, such as, as I say, the MQTT one, um, a couple of uh, different uh, exchange types, authentication, and things like that. So where this kind of really started, as I say, is, is the guys at Erlang Solutions do a very, very good job of supporting the RabbitMQ community in terms of providing services such as training uh, and consulting and, and things like that. Um, and so I thought I'd just really kind of wrap up this talk by, you know, a quick overview of Rabbit and then just talk about how you care for your Rabbit. You know, you don't have to take it to the vet or anything like that, um, but just where to find information and, and some good things to look at and, and so forth. One of the things about RabbitMQ, it's always had a very, very uh, active community and you tend to get very, very good support from the user group, the, the news group out there. A lot of information available. Alvaro, uh, who some of you will know, wrote the RabbitMQ in Action book um, some years ago, I think 2011, maybe 2012, the first edition of that came out. I mean, that book's been published in a variety of languages, including Chinese. Um, very good little book. Uh, some of the information in there would probably be a little bit dated these days. Uh, it, it probably needs a second edition, but I'm not sure Alvaro wants to do that at the moment. Uh, as I said before, the RabbitMQ guys from day one did a very, very good job of documentation. So the website uh, is, is full of useful little tips and, and very comprehensive information. The guys at Pivotal have done a good job of, of keeping that information uh, to a high standard and keeping it updated. Books, there, there are other books, but these are the two that I would recommend. Alvaro's book, RabbitMQ in Action, and uh, RabbitMQ in Depth is also another good book. Um, I forget the, the name of the author, but uh, another sort of big name in the RabbitMQ community. Uh, actually responsible, now that I think of it, for the most commonly used Python client, but we won't hold that against him. 
Now, I get plagued by these little graphics. You know, the Erlang Solutions guys have, have paid, I don't know who they paid, Google or whoever. I'll be reading the newspaper or something like that in my browser and I'll be getting these damn rabbits flashing in front of me. Um, you know, click here to get your, the health of your rabbit checked. Um, so in terms of commercial support, you know, like I said on the previous slide, there's plenty of good, good information out there for free. If you're, you know, some large corporation or something like that and you actually want 24 by 7 commercial support for the product uh, or training or whatever, you can go to Pivotal, Erlang Solutions and, and there are various others. Um, I'm actually in the process of putting together some training materials um, myself. It's actually getting a little bit out of hand because, you know, like I say with Rabbit, it's very easy to, to install and start using it, but there's all, this, all these extra bits under the hood. Um, and I, I, I dread to think I've, I've got far too much information, I need to have a cull. Um, but you can get training from Pivotal and Erlang Solutions, obviously, and likewise consulting services. And these things can be tailored, obviously, to meet specific needs. I mean, if you want help with uh, application development, not a problem. If you want more Erlang-centric help in terms of how best to set up and configure RabbitMQ for your environment, um, again, uh, Erlang Solutions and others can help. One interesting product, which I haven't mentioned, I'm not sure if it's on the next slide, maybe it is, uh, but there's a, a company that actually provide Rabbit as a service, Cloud AMQP. The good thing about Cloud AMQP is that they take away all of the need from your perspective to actually have to do anything from an administrative perspective with Rabbit. All you need to do is focus on developing applications that use the thing. Um, the guys at Cloud AMQP have best practice for how they configure clusters, how they configure RabbitMQ setups and so forth, and they do all the operational stuff, feeding and watering it and make sure things are working for you. Uh, you just focus, as I say, on your applications. That's a really nice service. Uh, keeping an eye on your rabbit, you know, you want to know what the little guys are up to. Um, there's a lot of products out there for monitoring rabbit. Um, the guys at Erlang Solutions have, have Wombat OAM, of course, uh, which is, is great because it's, it's an, another native Erlang technology. A lot of these products, like Datadog and so forth, actually hook in via the management UI. Uh, I mentioned before that that's like a RESTful API. So a lot of these management pro products will actually hook into that to monitor what's going on within RabbitMQ. This guy, Prometheus, is quite nice because, once again, it's also an Erlang plugin, so a plugin for Rabbit. So, in summary, RabbitMQ has been around for a long time now, over a decade, 12 years, um, and still remains very popular, and I think that popularity continues to increase. Um, talking to Erlang Solutions, I mean, they're, they're saying that they're you know, continually getting more and more requests for, for, for training, for support, and, and so forth. Um, as a piece of software, it's, it's very well architected, well written, highly extensible. Like I say, very easy to get going and actually start doing something useful with it takes full advantage of the capabilities of Erlang um, to do what it does in terms of reliability and, and, and scalability and so forth. Plenty of help available out there. Get into it, use it, call us if you want training, if you want uh, consulting, anything like that. Okay, so I've probably gone through that incredibly quickly, David, but we'll cope. Alrighty, thanks Brent. I probably should take two minute questions since I think we're getting close to here, but we can probably take a few. Please Let's repeat see. the question just so it'll get okay, the video. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, in, in the cluster, you know, uh, how is it set up in terms of master-slave and things like that? Um, it's not kind of such a, a simple, it's not so simple to answer that question. Um, it, it's a little bit more complicated than, than a simple master-slave type scenario. If you look at queues, for example, and, and replicated queues, so a queue that's potentially mirrored across one or more of the cluster nodes, um, that queue will essentially have, you know, essentially lives on a primary node. So in that sense, you've kind of got a master-slave thing. And if that node goes away, the queue, the, another node will eff effectively pick up the master role as far as that queue is concerned. Uh, but it's not really a master-slave type scenario. 
uh, in that respect at all. It, it's, the, the cluster, as I say, has a shared view, has a common view of users, of messages, of queues, of exchanges, or whatever. So it, it's, it, every cluster node has essentially the same view of the world. How are queues actually implemented in Erlang underneath everything? Uh, so, I mean, in the case of queues, you can queues can either be durable or, or transient, and the messages in those queues can either be volatile or persisted to disk. So, I mean, essentially, you know, the simplest scenario, but Rabbit will try and buffer as much information in memory as possible. Um, but it will only ever hold one copy of a, a message in memory. So if you take like that fan out exchange where a message could be routed to multiple queues, there's kind of like a counter that decrements. There's only one copy, copy of the message and when it gets to zero, poof, that, that's it, the end of things for that message. Um, the on-disk structure is um, essentially write only and there are journals and things like that, fairly standard stuff. Um, but the in-memory in data structures, I couldn't tell you exactly off the top of my head what, what what they're doing there. I guess but what I was wondering was, uh, from what I remember seeing somewhere, the process, a, a, a single process, each queue is correct. A, each one each queue, process. each queue is is one Erlang process. So you know you, you've got to watch it there. Actually, it's an interesting point. I mean, we could talk about this all day. I mean, it's kind of bar room discussion territory. But um, so you you did write a, a queue is an individual is a, is one Erlang process. So you've got to watch yourself there, for example, if you've got a multi-core system, you could still essentially kind of saturate the environment if you're publishing flat out to essentially to one exchange which is publishing everything to one queue. You, you could actually start to get Rabbit um, upset about the rate, of, the, the rate at which things are happening there and to start pushing back on those publishers. So when you're designing an application, you, you need to actually think about the topology. You know. Uh, it doesn't care, Erlang and Rabbit, they, it doesn't care how many queues you've got, it doesn't care how many exchanges you've got, you know, it doesn't care how many, it doesn't impose any restrictions on these things. Um, so you, you do need to think carefully about how you structure your application, yeah. The, the largest cluster, I think, like I said in the talk, was about 50 nodes, um, but that was, that was more an academic exercise than something that was useful. Um, I am aware of people having created larger ones, but again, purely as an academic exercise. I mean, realistically, if I think of sort of production deployments, I, I can't think of too many that would go maybe above a dozen nodes or something like that. Well, I mean, theoretically nothing, but I mean, obviously you've got, if you're replicating queues and so forth, you've got an awful lot of chatter occurring between those nodes. And, you know, there, there may be a point where it, it's just not sensible, shall we say. But, I mean, theoretically there's no limit. You could scale as far as you like if that makes sense for your use case. It's just in general it doesn't make sense. <laughs>